All right, um, so again, I guess I'll be the first speaker, so we'll get going. So, anyway, <laughs> my, I have daughters that uh, always tell me jokes, but they have to be clean, so, so an amino acid. All right, so today we're going to talk about the uh, basics of uh, sequencing technologies. So, there's, uh, and see, we've gone through first generation, second generation sequencing, now third, and even in the forefront, fourth generation sequencing we talk about. I will come back later also talk about some of the commercial offerings. So I'll, you'll hear from me at the very end with some concluding remarks. Um, just a review from the last session for some of the people that weren't here last time and just to bring everybody so we have the same terminology. The DNA encodes all the you know, genetic uh, material that has um, segments of genes called exons, which are the coding areas of DNA, and the introns, which are in between those areas. And this, when it is transcribed into RNA, and you have reading across all that, but then to get messenger RNA, you get rid of the, entro the introns, and it's just the exons. Um, and this is, leads to then translation to proteins. But during the process of putting that together, RNA can be arranged differently in something called alternative splicing. So one gene with its series of exons can code for different forms of the protein. So and now we'll just get into the technology aspect. And I guess uh, go back into the late 1980s. Uh, and this is really the basis that allows a lot of the sequencing reactions now to happen. It's called polymerase chain reaction. And this is a way of taking a small amount of DNA and making uh, billions of copies so that you can then analyze it. And this is done by, you have a segment of DNA with both strands, and you have a little primer. I think uh, the arrow is showing up here, okay, in the top, top left. The little primers that uh, bind to each end, and everything in between the two primers is going to get amplified. And this is done with a, a DNA polymerase. Now, what was the finding or the key finding in using the polymerase chain reaction was that a, thermo, a stable DNA polymerase that did not get denatured at high temperature uh, was discovered in hot baths, in bacteria in hot baths. And so what happens is you can put a little test tube and some DNA, um, the primers, uh, the base pairs, and this enzyme in, and you will then can replicate it by running through a series of cycles. At high temperature, the DNA uh, 95 degrees centigrade, the DNA denatures, the primer, then you cool it down, the primers bind, and then uh, at 72 degrees, they'll elongate, or you'll get the, uh, the replication. But that's done over and over and over again, and you get multiple copies of the DNA between the two primers. Now, in order to then assess where there's mutations, this is from a, this little gel here, a picture of, a, of electrophoresis gel, is from a paper that I did back in the early 90s where we looked for mutant KRAS in pancreas cancer. And the, these restriction enzymes are called that because they, they only recognize a very particular sequence of DNA. And so it will cut if it recognizes that sequence, and it's usually four or six base pairs. Um, so in this case, it would cut if it was wild type or normal. So this would be the DNA, but then you do the restriction enzyme digestion and it would cut. If it did not cut, it was mutated. So we'd run a pancreas cancer sample here and you see there's wild type DNA, but there's also mutant DNA. And this is the, what we call restriction um, enzyme digestion or RFLP, or restriction fragment length polymorphisms to then detect mutations. But this is looking for a very specific site mutation. And it's ideally suited for one. Now, in order to validate that, these are also from the same paper where the old sequencing reaction. And this was done by actually um, using, similar to PCR, but you'd use radio-labeled nucleotides. And you'd have four different ones, Cs, Ts, As, and Gs. And you'd run them out in the column. And they'd be separated by size on electrophoresis gel. So you, then you would just code this. This would be G, G, A, C, C, T. And that would be the sequence of the DNA uh, because they're separated by size. Now here you can see that there are two bands. 
So you have both G and T, so there's some mutations. The wild type is GGT, coding for glycine as the amino acid, but here, because of this T being present, is GTT, and it changes the codon, then transcribes to valine, and that's the mutation, and that's in a hot spot of the KRAS gene. Very similar sequencing, or Sanger sequencing, is done um, in a machine that uh, uses, instead of radiographic or auto radiography with radioactively labeled things, you have fluorescent labeled base pairs. And these, these um, are also, basically you have the template DNA, you have a primer, and then it elongates. And after each one of these radio labeled or uh, fluorescently labeled uh, uh, base pair um, are added on, then the reaction is stopped. And again, they can be separated out by size when using capillary gel electrophoresis, and a laser is run through, and it detects which color. So each peak then tells you by which color it is, GG, but when you have a double peak, there could be a presence of a mutation. Uh, and, you know, it could tell you if it's a G or a T. So it's, it's basically this same technology, but run a little fancier and nicer, and, um, and it's more automated. This, this is very manual process. So that's the first generation Sanger sequencing. Then you've all heard about next generation sequencing and the vendors primarily were 454 Life Sciences and, and Illumina now is the dominant market leader and they use this next generation technology. What you do is you extract DNA from your sample and you can do this on paraffin or, fresh, or frozen tissue or fresh blood, I guess, and you can, and this is extracted and you basically get very small fragments, two to 300 base pair fragments of DNA. And you attach these adapters on either end of the fragments of DNA, that'll let them bind to something called a flow cell. And this flow cell has little fingers that these things attach to, and the reaction occurs on the flow cell. And it's a very similar kind of reaction where you get incorporation of the fluorescent, um, fluorescently labeled base pairs, uh, and then it's, it's called bridge amplification because as these elongate, they flop over and attach on the other end. So it's a bridge, bridge amplification, but it's based on the PCR reaction, same way. And this Illumina sequencer then is really basically a fancy fluorescent camera that reads all these things. Um, so this is called massively parallel sequencing because that's what it is. You're doing billions of reactions um, all in these flow cells. The reads are short. They're somewhere around 150 to 300 base pairs typically. And I'm better speed up. <laughs> okay. Um, so but the, what you get is akin to put in a dictionary through a shredder and getting little fragments of 100 base pairs. Now a computer has to realign has to realign those, so it requires massive amounts of uh, computing power to put all those fragments, map them to a reference genome. So I won't get into the details of the bioinformatic process then because of time, but this is you know basically supercomputer work now. So what you end up with is something like this, and this is one of the um, formats for viewing these, and each one of the horizontal lines is a read. And you'll see the same KRAS gene, glycine to valine, position 12. The gray means wild type or normal, but any time you have a substitution, it shows up. And you can see the percentage of the abnormal reads is the allele frequency. And the genome can be depicted like this as a circos plot, where the mutations are, are, are ticks. You have copy numbers where you have either excess or loss. And in this case, we have a loss right here because you see a dip in this region of the chromosome uh, 10. And when we cone down on that area, you can focus in really carefully. And in this computer is annotated, and this is the P10 oncogene. So you've lost or you have a deletion in P10. That's basically how we read those. So the benefits of Sanger sequencing are it's fast. It's ideally suited for a small number of genes or targets and a very familiar workflow relatively low sensitivity, so you have to have at least 15 to 20 percent allele fraction to be able to, to, to make reliable calls. And it's not scalable because it it's really labor-intensive relatively. So targeted next-gen sequencing, you can do 
higher frequencies because it's automated, so you can sequence to um, higher power for discovery, detect lower mutation rates, you know, down to 5% or even less uh, mutated DNA. And then when you're doing large number of targets, it's more cost effective. And all the sequencing panels like Foundation and Keras are basically using, they're almost all using Illumina-based uh, things. This is third generation uh, sequencing, which is coming up uh, as the next technology. And the real, and this is done a little different. Instead of sequencing by synthesis, which is the next gen sequencing, this is done a little different. You denature the DNA, and it goes through a little enzyme motor that pushes it through this little tiny pore. And an electrical current is run off that, and it basically shears off each base pair as it goes through. And based on the electrical signal that's, that's generated, they can deduce whether it's a C, an A, a T, or a G. And it's, so it's reading. But this can read very long fragments of DNA, and it's not based on synthesis. So it overcomes some of the bias that can be associated with PR, PCR amplification. It's faster. You have long reads. Um, so you, you don't, it, it changes the way you have to uh, ref, uh, map it to reference genomes. Um, and particularly uh, higher consensus accuracy for rare variants. You can do single molecule sequencing. And particularly, I think, is going to be the real hallmark for this is you can directly sequence RNA without first going to cDNA. And, um, and then you get the full-length transcripts. You can do multiple isoforms or the splice variants we talked about and uh, non-coding RNAs. And the promise is for uh, direct RNA methylation analysis as well. It offers lower costs, and people are talking about eventually getting down to um, the uh, $100 genome. I mean, right now we're at the $1,000, but even getting lower. So right now, the error rates are a bit higher, so that's still a concern. And as far as I know, we talked about it. There's no CLIA-approved labs for clinical use. It's in research use only right now. So what can we evaluate? Whole genome. That's ideal when you're doing blood samples and things, and you get all the coding and non-coding DNA. You can do exome, which is all the coding DNA uh, regions of the gene, or as most of like foundation care seems to talk, panels, which are subsets of genes. You got small panels, large panels, things like that. But this is and the advantage, you know, of uh, the gene panels less expensive, takes less computing power, um, generally faster in terms of the, especially in terms of the interpretation. Oops, we're going to get back to that when I come back. Oh, oh no, we're going to talk about that now. So I meant to. The last little bit is you'll hear about circulating tumor DNA. It's a little bit about technology. Again, sequencing depends a bit on the allele frequency or how, how the sensitivity. Now, when you have circulating blood, most of the DNA in the blood's normal. And if you're looking for tumor DNA, it may be at a very low concentration. The advance that allows you to do this is you can use unique DNA sequences into the primers that serve as barcodes. So when you do PCR, if there's a mistake during replication in PCR, it, it is in, it'll develop in a PCR product that doesn't have a barcode. So it will, you will only get true mutations when you have the barcode and the mutation present. So this is sort of allowing us to lower the sensitivity uh, and get much uh, better tumor DNA detection. And that's one of the technologies. Where we're using it is for looking for early signs of tumor recurrence or emergence of uh, resistant therapies uh, uh, to some of these targeted therapies. So um, I guess that's my last bit. Uh, and then I'll be back to talk a, a little bit about some of the commercial panels that are available. So the next speaker is Dr. DeLilly. Dr. DeLilly is a medical geneticist. She's one of a very select group of about 150 uh, board-certified uh, board internal medicine and genetics physicians in the U.S. She's got a 15-year experience in both cancer and non-cancer genetics. She did her fellowship at Harvard with a focus on stem cell therapy and uh, diabetes. She joined Hogue in 2012, and she's a medical director of genetics. She helps us with uh, running our pancreas cancer early detection program. She's involved in the Lefromeni surveillance registry, which we have, and uh, has been a valuable member to our team. So, Tina. Thank you. Good evening. Um, I have a cough. I'm not contagious. That's my disclaimer. Um, all right, so let's get started. Um, first, I'm going to talk about what our first section was, just a recap. So when you came, uh, the first section was mainly broad brushstrokes about 
different mechanisms for cancer development outside of your typical means. So we think of chromosomal structural abnormalities, whether it's in the sex chromosomes or the autosomes, microdeletion syndromes, I gave you an example of Wager syndrome, Mendelian disorders, that's your autosomal dominant, recessive conditions, rasopathy, so that's your, you know, KRAS and uh, that whole pathway where we think of syndromes like Noonan syndrome, um, and Costello syndrome, so there's dysmorphism associated with it. Overgrowth syndromes like Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome where they have um, renal cancer, uh, uh, hepatoblastoma, and so forth. Uh, microRNA disorders and telopathies, which are the telomere disorders. So those were the broad br brush strokes that we painted last time, and so this time we're going to go a little more into detail about the different syndromes that we see in different areas. And following me, Jeannie will give additional examples about different uh, families that she's seen. <clears throat> so when we think of breast cancer and the syndromes that are associated with it, we have various uh, you know, high-risk alleles that we find. For instance, your BRC1 and 2, which is your hereditary breast and ovarian cancer syndrome. Uh, we know that BRCA1 has more of a lifetime risk of 72% versus 69% in BRCA2 for breast cancer, lifetime risk. Um, that risk has changed over time with the number of studies that have been done. Um, and so it, it looks like they're becoming pretty much equal, but BRCA1 is still ahead in that aspect. Lee Fermini syndrome, uh, which has an average onset of 32 years of age in uh, females and 54% lifetime risk. Hughes Jager syndrome, which is your STK11 mutation, which has up to 54% lifetime risk. And then PALP2 is one of the newer ones uh, where uh, we have up to 58% risk, um, and P10, which is Cowden syndrome, up to 50% risk. Um, <clears throat> Jeannie had talked about one of her families last time, which was hereditary diffuse gastric cancer syndrome. That has an association with uh, lob lobular subtype uh, breast cancer, uh, up to 50% lifetime risk. And then um, after that, you have the moderate risk alleles, which has a relative risk of about two. Uh, that's your CHECK2, RAD51, and the ATM heterozygotes. Colorectal cancer. So when you think of just uh, colon cancer in general, the risk factors that are associated with it in the general population when you refer to the National Institute of Health right now and looking at the SEER webpage, they risk a lifetime, uh, lifetime risk for both men and women of 4.2%. If you have a personal history of colorectal cancer, uh, the recurrence depends on the stage of the original cancer. Inflammatory bowel disease has up to a 40% lifetime risk. And then you get into HNPCC, which is your non-polyposis colon cancer, which has, depending upon what paper you read, has either 70 or up to 80% lifetime risk. And then at the top of this is FAP, which is familial adenomatous polyposis, which has uh, even near 100% lifetime risk if they don't undergo colectomy. So just to generalize a little more and simplify it, uh, for colorectal cancer, we think of it as either polyposis or non-polyposis. Uh, FAP is your uh, prototype for uh, the polyposis type, uh, and at the heart of it is APC mutation, which is your tumor suppressor gene. You have a loss of function in that gene. Uh, up to 30% are de novo mutations, where there it's a spontaneous mutation, and um, the colon is just riddled with polyps, hundreds of polyps, and they begin in early childhood and up through adolescence. And again, as mentioned, it has greater than 95% lifetime risk for colon, colorectal cancer and 50% by 33 years of age. Uh, HMPCC, on the other hand, which is your Lynch syndrome, uh, we think of the mismatch repair genes, MSH2, MLH1, MSH6, and PMS2. I left off of here EPCAM, which is in association with MSH2, and um, it hypermethylates the MSH2 promoter region uh, leading to cancer. Um, in these cancers, when we look at the histology, up to 95% have microsatellite instability. Um, however, we know that in those patients that don't have Lynch syndrome, up to 10% have this MSI and it's not Lynch syndrome. Uh, the tumors arise from adenomas and again, as we mentioned, up to 80% lifetime for uh, colon cancer. All right, Lee Fermini syndrome, 
Uh, it was first identified in children with sarcomas and family history of early onset breast cancer. Uh, TP53 is the gene, that, the faulty gene, it's the guardian of the geno genome, and it's involved in all aspects of cell cycle, uh, checkpoint repair, apoptosis, and so forth. 85% uh, lifetime risk for tumor development, and it's just, think of any cancer, and almost all the major ones are associated with it. Again, breast cancer, the sarcoma, soft tissue and osteosarcoma, brain cancer, adrenal, leukemia, colon, and um, it, the list goes on. Um, the surveillance that was brought up and uh, formed was based on children, and it was called the Toronto Protocol. And it was uh, created after years of surveilling these children. And so it has been modified and has been brought up to date, and the surveillance is applied to adults as well. Here at Hope, we do have a relief from any surveillance study. And I can tell you that some of the patients that we have enrolled are kind of atypical. Uh, for instance, we have one patient. He's a gentleman in his 40s. He came in for genetic counseling through our hereditary cancer program because of his family history of colon cancer. Lo and behold, he had a gene panel testing and he was found to have a TP, TP53 mutation. What's interesting about his case is that he's Brazilian and the mutation that he carries in TP53 is a founder mutation. And um, what we see in that, that Brazilian population is that the cancer shows up later in life, not in children necessarily, and so that's why it's missed. Um, so he's, that's, that's one of the cases that we have. Um, and we, have, we are using the modified proto uh, Toronto protocol to surveil these patients. Okay, another one of our typical syndromes, uh, we used to call it tuberous sclerosis uh, syndrome, but now we call it a complex. It involves two genes, TSC1 and TSC2. Two, two thirds of the mutations are de novo. And uh, you have skin findings like hypopigmented macules on the skin, uh, shagreen patches, which you can see right here. Um, and then uh, you have these periungal uh, fibromas, and then the, on the face, fibromas as well. Uh, so those are some of the skin findings that are very typical of this condition. And then uh, the risk is for giant cell astrocytoma, renal angiomyolipoma, the cardiac rhabdomyoma, actually is seen in the pediatric population and it recedes. Uh, by adulthood, it's, it's gone. Uh, lung lymphangiomatosis is also another one. Interestingly enough, when you have TSC2 is right next to polycystic kidney disease uh, gene, and so if there's a contiguous gene deletion, meaning both of them are deleted, uh, you have features of both polycystic kidney disease and tuberous sclerosis. Von Hippolindau is another one of our classic syndromes where the gene that is at fault or is, um, has a pathogenic variant is VHL, which is again a tumor suppressor gene. And so you see hemangioblastoma of the cerebellum, the retina, spinal cord, pheos are highlighted in this, renal cell cancer, and endolymphatic sac tumor. That's very specific to this condition. Um, so I'm highlighting some of the interesting parts of this. I mean, we could go on and on, but there's a reduced risk for renal cancer in those patients that have a complete gene deletion. All right, so MEN2. So there are different types of multiple endocrine neoplasia. Type 2 is the one that we're talking about. Uh, it involves the RET gene. Uh, 2B is seen mainly in infants, and 2A is the one that we see in adults medullary thyroid cancer, pheos, and parathyroid disease. Uh, the picture that you see is a 16-year-old female. She has medullary thyroid cancer, uh, and she has these ganglion neuromas of her tongue. Uh, but the ganglion neuromas can be seen in the GI tract and can be confused with Hirschsprung disease. Um, on the other hand, you can see just familial medullary thyroid cancer without other manifestations of this condition. And it's, again, caused by specific mutations within the red gene. So why do you want to, you know, what's the purpose? Why do we want to identify these syndromes? It's because there's imaging, diagnostics, uh, and prophylactic surgery and targeted therapy for some, if not all, of these conditions. And hopefully, uh, 
will get to a point where there's targeted therapy for all of them. You know, at the top of your list, you have the hereditary breast and ovarian cancer, where you have all modalities of management that are involved, uh, whether it's from imaging uh, to diagnostics, prophylactic surgery and targeted therapy, the checkpoint inhibitors uh, that we talk about, or immunotherapy for that point. Uh, Lynch syndrome, um, you know, we think of, so even though, so diagnostics and targeted therapy is there for Lynch syndrome, um, but uh, APC, which is your familial adenomatous polyposis, has some targeted therapy, but it's not on here because uh, I think it's on the fence. So we're talking about aspirin. They find that the polyp burden is reduced, but not necessarily the cancer risk for these subset of patients. Um, and then, so the list goes on. So that's why you want to di identify these patients because there's surveillance that's important for their um, management. All right, so Dr. Demur talked a little about the different types of technology that we've um, been using over the years. Single genes, <clears throat> initially when a patient would come in, you know, we would do one gene based on their family history and their personal history. So for instance, let's say that, that male that I talked about that's in our Lee from Mini protocol, if he had come in and he just had that family history of colon cancer, I don't think we would have gone after the TP53 gene. That wouldn't be at the top of our list. So, um, so this was back in the 1990s and 2000s, the 2000 era where you know the two, four, two to four gene panels started showing up in the 2000 uh, era, and uh, so that was the manifestation of next gen sequencing in conjunction with Sanger sequencing. Um, and then we have multiple gene panels, which is our standard of care, and we're on the threshold of, and we're using it, the whole genome and whole exome analyses. That's where we are. That's where we're headed. It's just a matter of time before that's going to be the standard of care. So outcomes of hereditary panel testing. Why do these big gene panel testings? It's more efficient, and it simplifies the process. You don't have to pull the patient in multiple times to do the testing. You get it done once. But on the other hand, you have surprising results. You have atypical family history or the right gene uh, but the wrong tumor. Um, I can tell you my personal experience with some patients that have a BRCA mutation, for instance. They come in and there's some colon cancer in their family, and I'm seeing this quite a bit, and that's not part of the pattern. So is it the right gene but the wrong tumor? I don't know, but that's something to keep in mind that we do use um, patterns within families to identify potential gene mutations, but it's not necessarily the right pattern. Um, and then again, these panels of genes include preliminary evidence genes or uh, genes that have limited information regarding their pathogenicity. So some of that information is yet to, you know, it has to be processed and we have to gather more data, so more to come on that. And then there's your VUS. You have increased likelihood of getting these VUSs where we don't know what to do with them. They're not clinically actionable. Um, and in one study looking at breast cancer genes, 30 in total per patient, on average the number of VUSs that were identified were 2.1. So how do you go from tumor gene profiling to germline uh, interpretation? Um, we know that there are specific founder mutations um, in addition to, for instance, BRCA1 loss of function mutations that suggests an underlying hereditary component that needs to be investigated. Um, again, EPCAM that I mentioned is a gene that's uh, close to another gene that's associated with Lynch syndrome. It acts to hypermethylate the other gene, uh, causing it to be silenced, and so it has a role in Lynch syndrome. Um, and then again, when the tumor itself is very uh, um, specific, like that endolymphatic uh, sac tumor um, for von Hippel-Lindau, or medullary thyroid cancer in the case of RET, uh, is very important to make sure that you backtrack and do some germline testing. All right, what about those patients that have no family history of, can uh, of cancer? They have cancer, but there's no family history. And so we're talking about these unselected cancer patients. So multiple studies have been done in about 10 to 15 percent of these pediatric and adult cancer populations carry a pathogenic or likely pathogenic variant in a variety of these dominant cancer genes. Um, 
And then, again, when we look at the models, the risk models that we use, in hindsight, retrospectively, many of these studies demonstrate that only 50% of patients with germline findings would meet clinical criteria for genetic testing. So it means we have to do a better job. We have to come up with better ways of looking for patterns and, and doing the due diligence to identify these patients. And the reason for that is because it's more specific rather than sensitive. All right, so we're kind of switching gears now and we're talking about how we uh, apply genetic testing to other conditions outside of cancer. We're talking about systemic disorders. It encompasses neuropsych, cardiovascular, pulmonary, any part of the body you can think of. So when you talk about neuro, neuro or psychiatric testing, we think of autism or autism spectrum disorder in children. We know that 20 to 25 percent have a genetic uh, cause. We find it, um, and, but if we don't, there's still a 5 to 10 percent risk for their uh, siblings. Uh, psychiatric disorders are rampant in certain conditions like velocardiofacial syndrome, which is a microdeletion syndrome of 22Q.112. Uh, uh, and, and that has like a 20% lifetime risk for psychiatric disorders. And uh, addictive disorders have a heredi hereditability uh, component of 70%. Uh, we haven't fine-tuned the actual genes as far as putting that in a clinical aspect, but we know it exists. Movement disorders like Parkinson, Huntington, and various ataxias, your myopathies, the X-linked Duchenne and Becker muscular dystrophy, oculopharyngeal muscular dystrophy, and myotonic dystrophy, and neuropathies like Charcot-Marie too. So giving you one example for neurology, um, last year I saw a 55-year-old female who in 2015 uh, had, uh, she had an aortic dissection. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, this is my neurology case, my bad. 55-year-old female with a recent diagnosis of bipolar disorder, and she had a low threshold tremor in her right thumb. And she came in and she wanted testing for Huntington disease. Um, her two older sisters had Huntington disease and a cousin on her dad's side had Huntington disease. The results of testing were not available on her two sisters and that was important for us to obtain because we want to see you know, the repeat expansion uh, within the gene because it has ramifications for what we're looking for. Um, so with that said, her pedigree, um, so as she is, she has a large family, yeah? So 55 years old, there she is, no children, um, and her, let's see, so her 65-year-old sister had just been diagnosed, but the first one in the SIP ship that got uh, diagnosed was her sister, her oldest, who was diagnosed at 59 years of age. Um, and then there's this cousin on the paternal side who passed away at 65 years of age, diagnosed very early at 42 years of age. Um, interestingly enough, um, her father died early, prematurely, from coronary artery disease and myocardial infarction at age 58. So whether he had any neurologic manifestations or if he was in the um, early stages, we don't know. All right, so what did I do? So just like you get a pre-op clearance for someone that has a cardiac condition before you go for an elective surgery, we get a psychiatric clearance because there's a high suicide rate associated with these patients. So it took us six months to get her to a psychiatrist to get the thumbs up. Pardon my, my uh, I'm not very savvy with this, but um, uh, anyway, so we sent it off to Mayo and they did a PCR analysis looking at exon one to look at the CAG repeats and she's 39 CAG repeats. So that's, of course, in our world, that's, that's where it's uh, reduced penetrant. 40 and above is where we say, yep, you have Huntington disease. So that means she could or could not develop Huntington disease. It remains to be seen. So it's not a comfortable position for her to be in, but you know, it's something where we recommend that she go get neurologic evaluation on a yearly basis. And the good thing is, you know, because this has a chance of expanding with the next generation, that would have been something to worry about if she had a children, but she did not. So she complained of pain. She was saying, I have chronic pain, uh, multiple drug intolerances and allergies, and she wanted pharmacogenetic testing. So we said, okay, let's do it. We sent it off to Genelex. Uh, that's one of the labs that we use. And um, at the time that she came in, we sent off a list of her medications. She was on 
tramadol and the psychiatrist had put her on Wellbutrin for her psychiatric manifestations. And when she came and she said, you know what, I, they keep upping the dose of the Wellbutrin and I have insomnia, I'm nauseous, and I'm gaining weight. I'm not losing weight, I'm gaining weight. So it made sense when we saw this, uh, her drug-drug interaction and, and drug-gene interaction where she's a poor metabolizer of Wellbutrin. So jacking up the dose of the Wellbutrin was not the right idea. It's putting her on a different medication. So we gave her a copy and said, go back to your psychiatrist and you know, make changes to this regimen. Cardiovascular, we have cardiomyopathy, long QT syndrome, the aortic aneurysms, familial hypercholesterolemia, and, L and the lipoprotein disorders. Um, so a full circle with the hypercholesterolemia, we can test them for you know, abnormalities in the LDL pathway or triglycerides um, in conjunction with doing maybe a pharmacogenetic panel to see if there's any um, uh, statin toxicity. Uh, an example of a cardiovascular case, this is our 60-year-old female with a type A aortic dissection that occurred three years ago. She had a very strong family history of aortic aneurysm and dissection. Um, so mom's side French and paternal side American Indian and English. So she is here, she's 60 years old, and her father had passed away at age 58 from an aortic dissection and uh, her uncle at 62 years of age from an aortic dissection. So she had genetic testing. It took only three years to get the genetic testing, but she did it. And she has a mutation within the ACTA2 gene, which is the most common uh, mutation associated with these aortic, aortic dissections. And so she wanted her, her family members to get tested. So going back, we tested one of her daughters, uh, and the names have been changed, uh, one of her daughters, uh, was diagnosed as having it um, in addition to her brother um, who is up here and 59 years old. Um, interestingly, her, her, her sister did not have the mutation, but guess what? She has an aortic dilatation. So what that is, we don't know. Um, we did test the mother just to make sure she was negative for the mutation. So whether this is something else, environmental or some other factor, or she has another genetic etiology, we don't know. All right, um, to round it out, you know, pulmonary cystic fibrosis, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, your pulmonary hypertension, pulmonary fibrosis, and ciliary dyskinesia are some of the things that we see hemophilia, sickle cell disease, thalassemias, and hemochromatosis within the hematologic realm. And my favorite, the musculoskeletals, which is your uh, Ehlers-Danlos osteogenesis and perfecta. There are over 100 different subtypes of skeletal dysplasia, uh, Marfan syndrome, and Lowe's-Dietz syndrome. That's it for now. Any questions? Our next speaker is uh, Jeannie Homer. Uh, Jeannie um, has been here at Hogue uh, in, as a genetic counselor in the Hereditary Cancer Program for 17 years. She uh, graduated from Smith College with a degree in Russian language, which, um, and then she uh, spent the next 20 years raising a family and working as a software developer. She, developer. she then um, got her master's degree in genetic counseling at UC Irvine and became a genetic counselor. So she has um, going to follow on with additional uh, hereditary testing that was uh, from her speech last time. Um, how do you, I mean, the, no, the down arrows don't work. What do you? So we've got here. Scroll that down. Just like this? Yep. Okay. So at our last um, seminar, we talked about genetic counseling and genetic testing at Hogue and how that fits the definition of precision medicine in that it guides the screening um, and disease management of individuals. And tonight, I'm going to focus on direct-to-consumer genetic testing because that's something that we hear about every day, and maybe some of you have even participated in that, or you have patients who come to you with their test results wanting to know what that means. 
Um, we'll talk about what it, what it is. Is it considered precision medicine? How does it work? And go over some examples. So direct-to-consumer or DTC genetic testing are tests that are marketed directly to consumers. And these are heavily marketed to genetic um, to consumers, given as gifts. Um, there was a plan to hand out 55,000 of them at a football game that got um, by the Baltimore Ravens, but that got quashed before it happened. But um, it provides patients access to genetic information without involving a medical professional or their insurance. And this includes health, tra health traits, ancestry, and fi finding relatives. Um, there are genetic tests that will tell you what kind of wine you like in case you can't figure out that <laughs> another way. How does it work? So um, an individual would choose a test and order a kit or buy it at Target or Walmart. Then they provide a saliva sample. The laboratory analyzes the sample generates a report, and the person receives the report electronically, and then needs to figure out what it means. The technology used in most of this is called SNPs, or single nucleotide polymorphisms. This is not full gene sequencing and analysis like we do when we're doing testing on our patients. This is testing single letter variants in, a D in DNA, so maybe Maybe these variants are not even in a gene. They might be outside of a gene. And it's when there's two or more versions of a sequence present in more than 1% of a population. So say, for example, over here in this particular uh, spot in our DNA, some people have an A, some people have a C, some people have a G, and some people have a T. And say you see that you notice that the people with an A seem to be more likely to develop some kind of condition. Then you think, well, maybe that A is associated with that condition. And it, it may be, it may not be, it may be coincidence. Um, but this is the technology that's used here. And we have a lot of these SNPs in our genomes. And oftentimes, they're very specific populations. So they may discover that an A in that position in the Chinese paper population is associated with prostate cancer, but it may not apply to any other, any other population at all. So um, a colleague of mine, Katie Stoll, who lives and practices in Washington, thought she would try one of these kits. This company offered a $99 test um, for child development. And this is a test, as you can read, that will start you and your child on the path to lifelong discovery from fitness to natural abilities for language and learning, the results help you get to know your child even better. So she purchased this kit, and it's, um, it tests very few SNPs, so all you need is a swab. For, for more comprehensive analysis, you need to spit and get a whole lot of saliva, but this was just a swab. And she ran the test um, on her kid and says nothing was flagged is out of ordinary with Ginger's DNA. Ginger appears to be a pretty average kid in terms of her intellectual and athletic potential. And here's a picture of Ginger <laughs> with her test kit. So then she thought, well, I'm going to try this again. And this time she put on sterile gloves and swab tap water and sent it in got a 35-page report that was varied a little bit from Ginger's DNA. And it was signed out by a DNA laboratory director, PhD geneticist, and fellow of a major American genetics organization. So just, you know, you don't know exactly what you're getting here. Um, now, I'll be talking more about 23andMe, which is one of the very well-known um, direct-to-consumer testing companies. And questions may, that patients may have about this is, you know, my 23andMe results say I don't have BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation, so I can cancel my genetic counseling appointment, right? Or my 23andMe results say that I do have a BRCA1 mutation, now what? And here's my 23andMe raw data. Um, what does it mean? So because people were calling me and making appointments for these kinds of questions, I decided to do it myself. And you go on, I went on the website, and um, 
You have a choice of just doing the ancestry or, of course, they recommend their more expensive test, which is ancestry plus health. So I ordered a kit. And then this one, because they're testing 600,000 SNPs, requires spitting, you know, a lot of saliva. And they also ask you a gazillion questions, you know, screen after screen of questions about yourself. This was my favorite. Does the sound of other people chewing fill you with rage? Yes, no, or I'm not sure. And it's question after question like that. Um, then, about four weeks later, I received my test results through email. And the ancestry was pretty good, 98.9% um, European, that seemed pretty accurate. But when my sister had done it, my full sister had done it um, a little before me, um, her results said she was 38% sub-Saharan African ancestry. So they made a little mistake there, but then they corrected it. Um, relatives, that worked pretty well. This was the one that worked the best. They found my sister and my nephew and my niece. Traits, um, this is just a small subset. They, give, they supply you with information about a lot of traits. So this one, sweet versus salty, wrong. I really have a big sweet tooth. Um, likely my big toe is longer. Long, no, that's wrong. Also, my second toe is much longer than my big toe. I, do have, I don't have a unibrow. <laughs> likely to wake up around 6.39, 6.39 a.m., I wish. Um, but that's wrong. I wake up about an hour earlier. And I do have widow's peak. So they didn't do very well with the traits. Then comes the health part. They actually test a couple letters of DNA in a number of genes, including BRCA1 and BRCA2, um, age-related macular degeneration, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, celiac disease, glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency, hereditary hemochromatosis, hereditary thrombophilia, late onset Alzheimer, and Parkinson's disease. And you can see these numbers here refer to the, the letters of DNA that they're testing, the quantity. And, and these are genes that are maybe 10,000 letters of DNA long. Um, so I thought we could focus on, you know, it's an area of my expertise for several years, BRCA1 and BRCA2, and give you an example patient. So a 40-year-old female of Italian ancestry, family history of early onset breast cancer and a mother and maternal aunt, and concerned about her risk for breast cancer, so she decides to do 23andMe testing. That's easy. Um, no doctor or genetic counselor involvement, 199 for the test. But the test analyzes three out of over 2,000 possible mutations in BRCA1 and BRCA2. And if you notice the ethnicity, it's only used for people, useful for people of 100% Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry. The test results, as I said, take about four weeks. And, um, and if it is positive, it, it must be validated by a real clinical laboratory anyway. And um, there's some general information given about the results, but no estimate of her personal breast cancer risk and no screening plan really provided. Uh, no report sent to the MD, and it is done in the privacy of your home, but you know, do you understand their privacy policy? Tradition, comparing this with traditional, what we offer here at Hogue, the woman would meet with a genetic counselor who then orders appropriate testing Genetic counseling and genetic testing are paid in full by insurance for a woman like this with no cost sharing at all for the patient even if she hasn't met her deductible, so cost would be zero. We would have requested full analysis of multiple genes associated with breast cancer, including full analysis of BRCA1 and 2, not just the three Jewish mutations. Test results take one to three weeks. Results are interpreted by the genetic counselor Breast cancer risk is calculated, a screening plan is established, and if a mutation is found, we would arrange for cascade testing. That's testing for family members who would be at risk to carry the same gene mutation. And the laboratories that we work with offer that testing at no cost. And personalized detailed reports would be sent to the individual and physicians. And this is also through a fully HIPAA-compliant laboratory. Um, with the direct-to-consumer laboratories, 
for example, last summer, 23andMe sold all their data to a European pharmaceutical company. And they've also had a history of sample, sw um, sample switches. So the next thing people can do who do 23andMe, because they're only analyzing a few of the, they're only reporting on if some of the 600,000 SNPs that they're testing, is you can um, purchase third-party interpretation, analyze your raw DNA reports, and then um, I'll show you what that looks like because I decided to do that too. Um, bought it through Amazon, $12, and then you get your, your DNA report. So this stands for um, reference SNP, and that's just the number, and um, this is chromosome one, and this is the order of the DNA, and what my genotype was at that spot was AG. So this isn't really useful information, but they can then interpret it, and so my, uh, they interpret it, you know, in just very delicate terms, it says bad. So. <laughs> So in one particular change of mine, I have a 1.7-fold increased risk for rheumatoid arthritis. But I don't know the, the background risk for that, so I don't know if 1.7-fold, not even two times, I don't know if that amounts to you know 60% or 3% total. So here's another example. This is a patient I saw um, who is 55 years old, and she did 23andMe. She was very savvy. She did the Promethease interpretation. She also went to ClinVar. And she says, this item states that I have such and such a mutation in hereditary cancer predisposing syndrome P10. It's considered a pathogenic variant. I would like to have this confirmed by Hogue and be told what this means to me. So mutations in P10 cause Cowden syndrome, which is very rare, one in 200,000. Nearly 100% have large head size, many skin findings. We always say lumps and bumps for Cowden syndrome. And um, there's actually a much higher risk for breast cancer, even than BRCA1 and 2, 85%, usually between ages 38 and 46. And there's also an increased risk for thyroid cancer and uterine cancer. So she, um, she was mulling this over and analyzing her family. I have thyroid no nodules, I had a breast fibroadenoma, I have li lipomas, so, and her mother lost her sense of smell, maybe it was tumors that affected her, her nerves, and maybe this is why she had a hysterectomy in her 50s, and her son has suffered from intestinal issues from a young age, and I wonder if he inherited the P10 mutation from me. So she came in, we took a detailed family tree, four generations, here she is with a big circle around her. She is from a big family, um, and there are no cancers associated with Cowden syndrome at all. And her father's alive at 90, her mother passed away at 84, everybody's in their 80s, 70s. The only history was um, pancreatic cancer newly diagnosed in her brother. So our plan was to validate the P10 mutation through a clinical laboratory, and then we also thought we would do additional testing for hereditary pancreatic cancer and hereditary pancreatitis. So the laboratory report from the real laboratory um, talked about this and said that this variant is not detected in this individual. So they don't do such rigorous testing in, the, in these um, drug-to-consumer tests. And also, no mutations were found in any genes associated with pancreatic cancer or hereditary pancreatitis, so she was very happy. But I wasn't the only one who has done this. Other genetic counselors have also sent in confirmatory DNA samples. And um, Genetics in Medicine reported that the false positive rate was high, and they you know, really suggest confirmatory testing. If she hadn't been so savvy, she might still be sitting there thinking she has this 85% chance of breast cancer, she might have gotten double mastectomies, who knows. But this showed that um, 43 of us sent in variants for confirmatory testing. 40% of them, 17, were false positives. The labs could not find those mutations that were found by the direct-to-consumer testing. An additional eight or 19%, they confirmed that this change was there, but they said this is not a mutation at all. This is either benign or a variant of unknown significance. 
So some of them, some of them were real, but um, the majority were really not. So is DTC precision medicine? You decide. Thank you. Any questions for Jean? Yeah. Okay, so I know that the FDA originally didn't let 23 and me come out and do the medical stuff. Do you know what was behind why they finally allowed them to do it? Yeah, so they had originally offered a lot more genetic testing and reported a lot more health things, and the FDA shut it down. But then gradually they've been adding gene after gene. In fact, last week they added another gene, um, which will be really confusing because it's a recessively inherited um, colon polyp gene, M-A-T-Y-H or U-Y-H. And um, so they just, one by one, are getting some of these in. But they're, they're again, instead of sequencing the whole U-Y-H gene, they're doing two locations. So it's, it can be very confusing. What is the regulation for them? Are they are they under CLIA or? They're not, but the, but the um, they are FDA approved for those nine conditions now 10. But the test, the actual testing, it doesn't have any accreditation? No, no, it's not. Yeah. Okay. That's the same. Not like the CLIA, CLIA and CAP are the major accrediting organizations for, for labs, and the, the more stringent is actually the College of American Pathology. So you can be CLIA without CAP, but you can't be CAP unless, uh, CAP unless you're CLIA. And that, we talked about it a little bit last time. You have to have the analytic validity, saying that the mutations you find are actually there, as well as the clinical utility. Um, so this is my editorial, I like to call those, uh, for entertainment purposes only as the direct consumers. Uh, you know, I certainly as a physician would never treat a patient based on those findings. Um, but I think, you know, obviously the penetrance is there with the market. So our next speaker is uh, Dr. David Braxton. Um, he's going to explain a little bit more about what's going on with our pathology and our testing here in our programs that, the, that are going on at Hogue. He is a pathologist here. His special expertise is in um, gastrointestinal liver and pancreatic disease, as well as having a fellowship in uh, molecular genetics. Uh, anyway, uh, his research interests include uh, studying uh, driver alterations, as well as uh, mutations in biomarker profiles. He um, has, has a longstanding interest in molecular and cellular biology as an undergrad, he majored in biochemistry. I think, uh, remember, your fellowship was at Penn and and, and then UCLA for uh, pathology. So, anyway, David, thank you. So, it's, okay, that's the mouse I use. Okay, good. All right, so thank you guys for uh, being here in the uh, very welcoming introduction. Uh, a little bit of a recap from last time. I talked a lot about the DNA damage repair pathways, and here's our diagram uh, uh, with the DNA damage repairs. We talked a little bit about the functional assays of DNA damage repair um, and what we can do now really in one uh, next generation sequencing test, we can test for mismatch repair deficiency. And so that is uh, basically the inherited uh, cause of Lynch syndrome is, is the actual mismatch repair deficiency. Uh, all M mismatch repair deficient cancers are considered to be MSI high. Uh, so that's some of the terminology that you may have heard. And uh, all of these tumors that arise from mismatch repair deficiencies uh, uh, have high mutational burdens. Um, and so those can cancers are uh, approved to receive immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy now. Uh, we can also test for homologous recombination deficiencies um, in uh, one single NGS test by testing for the BRCA1 uh, and 2 genes, as well as many other genes involved in homologous recombination. And these are also targetable alterations. And in one, that same next generation sequencing test, we can measure that tumor mutational burden. And these patients are, uh, should benefit from immune checkpoint inhibitors as well. So we also talked a little bit about how, you know, or this was my approach to thinking about what is an actionable genomic variant in the cancers. You know, so we start out with a DNA variant. Uh, if it's in a, a gene that uh, promotes the selective advantage of the cancer cell, we can call that a driver alteration. And then we can break it down into whether it's actionable or not based on 
Uh, is it a sensitizing alteration? Is it a resistance alteration? Is that mutation actually present in the germline? And we're getting it in all the reports. Um, and so that's sort of how we think, go about thinking about whether a uh, gene variant in a tumor is actionable or not. Uh, so what I want to talk to you tonight about is more about uh, what the pathologist's role here in uh, Hoag's uh, genomics programs are. Um, and so what we do in our department is uh, we do what we call reflexed ordering protocols for uh, molecular biomarker testing. Um, and right now we're using a vendor that has a 592 gene panel. It uh, comes with uh, RNA fusion detection. It comes with your tumor mutational burden, as well as MSI, MSI testing. Um, and it has selected immunohistochemical biomarkers as well. We're doing this um, as a reflex when we get the specimen in the pathology department. Uh, we're doing that for lung cancers, head and neck cancers, sarcomas, uh, recurrent gynecologic cancers, as well as glio, glial-based neoplasms such as glioblastoma. We're also, also using a variety of other biomarkers, mostly immunohistochemistry, fluorescence in situ hybridizations, and some single gene testing um, in a variety of cancers such as breast cancer, GE junction cancers, uh, and some of the hematologic malignancies as well. So here's... Um, our pathologist reflex ordering protocols uh, compared to the traditional workflow of uh, a molecular diagnostics vendor. Uh, so the patient would end up at a physician's office, most likely an oncologist like Dr. Bertso here. Uh, he would have to submit a request uh, to the molecular lab to do the testing. Uh, so that molecular lab would then send the tissue request to the hospital pathology laboratory where the specimen was. We would then have to send the tissue back to the lab and uh, most of those test results would end up at the physician's office. And sometimes we in the pathology department didn't even know uh, what the test results were. So, uh, so when we have many physician's offices utilizing many other molecular laboratories, uh, it, it becomes very hard to keep track of this data. Uh, so what a reflex ordering protocol does is when the specimen comes through and the pathologist uh, makes the final diagnosis and releases that report, we also uh, put in place the uh, molecular testing orders. Uh, so as mentioned, we do that for a variety of cancer sites now. We directly send the test or test request with that tissue specimen immediately to a preferred molecular diagnostics vendor. And that test request comes, or the test results go back to the physician's office as well as come back to the hospital uh, pathology laboratories where we can keep track of that data. And for cancer sites that aren't in our reflex testing protocols, we're asking our physician offices to submit the request directly to the pathology laboratory so that we can keep this information loop intact. Uh, so what this does, there's a number of benefits to this. Uh, it ensures that standard of care is met, um, that you know, patients don't fall through the cracks so to speak, uh, it decreases the turnaround time because these tests can take, you know, two weeks, sometimes more uh, to complete. And sometimes, you know, it might be several weeks to a month before the patient actually goes sees a physician. So it really cuts down the turnaround time. Uh, as mentioned, we can capture all that genomic data coming out of these cancers and we can perform QA and QC on all that data. So some of the quality control measures that we're currently uh, taking place uh, we can check for adequacy for all these cancer specimens that are uh, leaving the pathology department. We review all the tissues prior to sending them out to these molecular diagnostics laboratories. It ensures that the appropriate tissues are sent and that uh, a hernia sac doesn't go off for testing somewhere and an inappropriate uh, result is issued. Um, so uh, we're also monitoring uh, what we call quality or quantity not sufficient results. Uh, this is typically when not enough tumor uh, tissue is present or that the DNA or RNA in that tissue specimen has degraded and is not good enough for the assay. So when we monitor these rates, we can tell uh, and troubleshoot any sort of problem that may be happening with our internal procedures in our laboratory or our vendor, preferred vendor laboratory, something's going wrong with them. Uh, so in the case that it is QNS, we can also send a, a new specimen before uh, any de significant delays happen. Uh, turnaround time tracking, we can, uh, when we're working with a single vendor, we can turn or, uh, track their turnaround time and make sure it's all uh, appropriate. Our current vendors uh, working around 8 to 11 days of turnaround time on average. It can be as long as two weeks sometimes. Um, so our internal turnaround time when we issue the test uh, order to when it's been sent out is usually the next day, so it's a pretty rapid turnaround time. Uh, we can also uh, do what's called limited tissue protocols. Uh, 
Um, because we're working with one lab, uh, we've set a priority list. When there isn't enough DNA to do these huge next-generation sequencing panels, we can uh, have a set protocol for a priority of tests that can be done with that limited number of tissues. So uh, in, in the traditional case, uh, that laboratory would have to send a request and somebody would have to sign off and tell them what to do. So we, we're taking care of a lot of these little issues here. So uh, since 2017, we've profiled over 400 cancers per year here. Uh, here's 2016 in October there. We launched our first reflex testing protocol uh, in lung cancers. And after several months, we rolled out uh, the remaining uh, reflex programs. And you can see our volume shot up quite nicely uh, after several months there. So uh, it's been a couple years now of having our full reflex testing in place. Uh, so what are the cancers that's actually being sequenced here? As mentioned, we're doing a lot of reflex testing, but we also get a lot of other orders in for uh, sequencing uh, these cancers. 34% uh, of them are lung cancers. Uh, the ovarian and other female genital tract cancers are, are second most common specific types, but we're also doing the colorectal cancers, um, pancreatic adenocarcinomas, melanomas, in 16% uh, of the cancers that are sequenced uh, are sort of other cancers that didn't, you know, add up to uh, or fall into any specific category. So just one-offs, bladder cancers, renal cell carcinomas, things like that. So we're doing a quite broad scope. Uh, so here's our lung cancer data uh, from about a year and a half. Had 159 uh, lung cancers that we sequenced during that time. And I've compared uh, our internal data with our benchmark data that we get from publications such as the, the Cancer Genome Atlas. And for the most part, we're really spot on in terms of what we would expect in our population, uh, with the exception of EGFR, which is those are the most important uh, lung or abnormalities in these lung cancers. And our population has a 24% rate of EGFR mutations compared to a benchmark about 14%. And so, uh, you know, we, when we have this data, we can ask ourselves what, what's the cause of that. And uh, what we know about EGFR mutations is that it does differ in populations. So uh, the never smoker populations, patients of Asian descent tend to have a, a much higher rate. So it's likely that Orange County has more non-smokers uh, than the national average. So uh, our test failure rate, our QNS rate for lung cancers is 3.7% during this time period. The benchmark for standards is less than 5%. Our limited tissue protocols uh, take place about 6% of the time. So these are really excellent uh, achievements here in terms of quality of testing that we're having. Our overall QNS rate for uh, the whole this past year is 2.5%. So that's super low. So um, our, our preferred vendor is doing an excellent job in our, um, our internal protocols for handling these tissues and preserving uh, the DNA and the amount of tissue is uh, really working out nicely. So here's a case example of metastatic lung adenocarcinoma. It's an EGF mutated uh, lung adenocarcinoma, and it was metastatic to a rib bone. Uh, so you're going to see the low power core biopsy and the adenocarcinoma cells in there. Uh, so after five months of uh, targeted anti-EGFR therapy, uh, there was a complete response in the metastatic rib site. So all the tumor cells have become necrotic, and these are some uh, calcifications there. And within the lobectomy, uh, uh, you know, uh, the primary tumor, which measured several centimeters, has shrunken down to about two millimeters. So this is a phenomenal response of this uh, cancer uh, on the anti-EGFR-based therapies. Uh, so what do we find in these uh, cancers um, and how often do we find it? Um, when we looked up and quickly sort of tallied up uh, the actionable results, uh, over half of the cancers had something actionable in them. And uh, as mentioned, we had a high rate, about 25% of um, cancers with EGFR. Some of the other actionable standard of care markers made up about another 2%. Uh, clinical trial indications, there's a number of biomarkers that are gaining a lot of evidence uh, of efficacy, uh, such as HER2 uh, mutations within the lung cancers. Uh, immunotherapy uh, as well made up about 8%. And uh, possible germline mutations. When we sequence the tumor, we're also sequencing these germ the germline DNA, and we can look and tell sometimes uh, that the patient's tumor actually has a mutation in it that's likely present in the patient's germline. So almost 9% of patients uh, had something where we would want them to go see the genetic counselors. And 30% of the time, we saw something prognostic. So overall, about 84% of lung cancers 
uh, that we studied here have something, uh, some sort of abnormality that we would consider to be informative. So that's a very, very high rate uh, and sort of justifies our, our reflux protocols. So what's our pathologist role of Lynch syndrome testing here? So this is Lynch syndrome or hereditary non-polyposis colorectal syndrome. So we do pathological screening of uh, all our uh, colon and uh, endometrial cancers. Um, and uh, basically the uh, cause of Lynch syndrome is that inherited defect in the mismatch repair pathway. We talked a little bit about it last time where uh, how we get the term microsatellite instability comes from uh, the actual nucleotide sequences are different, what they call microsatellites, and those are just repetitive DNA sequences. And when you have mismatch repair deficiency, they can expand or contract in that tumor. And so when, when you have instability of those microsatellite sequences, you get microsatellite instability. Uh, so we can do some assays for uh, mismatch repair and MSI high um, outside of the realm of next generation sequencing. And we do these in-house uh, or we do in-house in, in immunohistochemistry on all of our uh, colorectal and endometrial cancers. So here is a colon cancer. Uh, and these are the mismatch repair genes by immunohistochemistry. And you can see their nuclear expression is all intact. Um, in this particular one, this is not uh, intact, so that has loss of expression, and that's what we're looking for as sort of a positive screen. Um, so, uh, and we do this, uh, as I stated, on all of our endometrial and colorectal cancers. So here's a little bit more about um, how uh, this immunohistochemistry really helps. When we get an abnormal IHC result in one of those four mismatch repair proteins, if it's if it's the MLH1 or PMS2 um, combination of loss of expression there, uh, so we can perform another um, assay called MLH1 promoter hypermethylation. Same gene we're testing for uh, by immunohistochemistry. And doing this assay can help us uh, tell whether this is a sporadic microsatellite instability high cancer. Uh, or if this is related to Lynch syndrome. So if we don't detect the promoter hypermethylation, it's very likely to be a Lynch syndrome patient, and so that's when we would want the patient to go see our genetic counselors. Any of the other combinations of loss of expression in these uh, mismatch repair genes, that is significantly abnormal. Uh, we don't run any other assays to determine that, and those patients would be recommended to go seek genetic counseling. So what happens when uh, there's normal immunohistochemistry that we do, but there's a clinical suspicion of Lynch syndrome? Well, we can run the microsatellite instability by PCR-based testing. And if there's in microsatellite instability higher, what they say can be indeterminate as well, uh, that would be an indication to seek genetic counseling. Uh, if there's no MSI high, or if it's what we call microsatellite stable, that would be a patient where Lynch syndrome is unlikely. And so what we're doing, we're carrying out this protocol here um, in our current practice is that uh, if any abnormalities, we also notify our hereditary cancer program to help uh, get those patients testing. So switching gears just a little bit, uh, methods of variant detection. Uh, Dr. Demir talked a little bit about um, some next generation sequencing and other sequencing technologies. Uh, what I wanted to just reinforce is sort of the scale of the genetic variants and uh, where they occur in the DNA and how large they are really detect or uh, determine what kinds of tools we use to look for those mutations. And from the lowest level where we're looking at the DNA double helix to the largest scale of a chromosome, you have about three orders of magnitude. Uh, so that's a pretty big scale. Uh, so to illustrate that, uh, here you have one kilometer over where we are right now at Hogue Hospital, Newport Beach, sort of a bird's eye view. Uh, you can appreciate the surrounding neighborhood and houses and the tree-lined streets. And so three orders of magnitude higher is that is about a thousand kilometers uh, above here. And so you can see we're not talking about a neighborhood level anymore. We're talking almost the whole entire southwestern United States uh, with neighboring uh, metropolitan areas like Phoenix and, Phoenix and Las Vegas. So a thousand kilometers above the Earth is significantly higher than where the International Space Station uh, orbits. So uh, very large scale. And so when you're doing chemistry, chemical assays to detect these variants, you really uh, have to design your assays and your tools uh, on that scale where, where you're looking for the particular mutation. So where do, we, where do we look and how do we look for these big changes? Well, on the chromosome level, uh, such as numerical variants, we can use cytogenetic techniques such as karyotypes. Uh, 
uh, for translocations that happen uh, within the chromosome and some of the structural variants, we call them. You can use cytogenetic techniques. You can use fluorescence in situ hybridization probes. And we can sometimes use PCR-based technologies depending on what that exact um, translocation is. Uh, so what we call large copy number variants, which are uh, less than a translocation um, and less than a structural variant. Uh, we often call these gene gains or gene losses. Uh, we can use technologies called microarrays. Uh, we can also use a multiplex ligation probe dependent amp amplification. Uh, we can also use some fish probes uh, to quantify uh, gain or loss of these types of gene changes. And so on the smaller level where we're talking about single nucleotide variants and small insertion deletion type uh, uh, mutations, uh, PCR fragment size analysis is typical or in, the, in, in the traditional sense. Um, uh, PCR genotyping uh, and Sanger sequencing can be useful. And to sort of hit home the, the how powerful next generation sequencing is as a technology, it's really replacing uh, many of the uh, standard uh, microbi or, uh, molecular diagnostic techniques. Uh, we're now able to look for not only just the smaller uh, type of mutations, uh, we're getting copy number variations and a lot of the uh, sort of translocations and gene fusion techniques now that are clinically actionable. Uh, so we're not quite up to doing a virtual karyotype by next generation sequencing, but uh, it's really, um, really becoming a very strong and powerful technology that we can use for diagnostics. So what kind of specimen types can you use for cancer biomarker and molecular testing? Uh, most everything now can be done on our routine pathological specimens. Uh, that's routine formal and fixed paraffin embedded tissues. Um, we can do IHC, we can do PCR, we can do FISH, we can do Sanger sequencing, and we can do uh, next generation sequencing just based on the standard uh, routine specimen types. We can do them on small samples, such as core biopsies, uh, FNA biopsies, and even fluid cytologies. Fluid cytologies doesn't always work really well for next generation sequencing, but sometimes we can have some success. Uh, and large tissue specimens are particularly easy. We have tons of tissue to work with when you have a colonic resection and we have a large tumor there. Uh, fresh tissues, why would you need fresh tissues? Well, you don't really need fresh tissues to run uh, a lot of these uh, biomarkers anymore. That sort of was the, the old way of doing things when these techniques weren't really good. You had to have fresh or fresh frozen tissues. Uh, if you want to do a karyotype uh, on some cytogenetics, uh, cell culture techniques, you do need some fresh tissues. Um, and also bone marrow specimens typically come fresh to the lab, and so we can do all sorts of things with fresh tissues uh, in the bone marrow space. Wanted to touch on liquid biopsies as well, uh, as mentioned. Uh, so it's a very particularly interesting phenomenon, and you're going to hear a lot about it um, in the coming years, I'm sure. What a liquid biopsy is fundamentally is uh, here you can see the blue cells of the tumor, and you know, tumor cells turn over, they become apoptotic or they become necrotic, and they shed DNA into the bloodstream, or sometimes even the, there's circulating tumor cells. So here, this blue guy is the circulating tumor cell. And now we can do a, uh, a vein puncture and get blood out, and that DNA that's floating around or those circulating tumor cells are present in that vein puncture tube. Um, and there is some competition uh, with the normal circulating DNA. There are some healthy tissues that turn over DNA as well. Uh, and as, as Dr. Demir mentioned, uh, the technologies for measuring the differences has really increased. Um, so there's a lot of different biological principles that are going on, how we, how we measure this. Um, some of it's called exosomal DNA. Uh, often what we're hearing a lot about now is uh, what they call circulating tumor DNA or cell-free DNA is the same thing. And you can get circulating tumor cells assays as well. Uh, there's varying technologies that are used for this. Uh, you'll hear digital PCR being used, beaming technologies. Uh, some of it's uh, actually shifting towards the NGS realm in technologies now. So what kind of samples are liquid biopsies? Well, blood samples, uh, urine, saliva has even been explored, um, and CNS fluids. So it's really going to change the paradigm uh, for how we detect and how we measure uh, cancer disease going forward. So what is the state of liquid biopsy right now? Well, the NCCN guidelines uh, for non-small cell lung cancer state that you know, liquid biopsy should not be used in lieu of a tissue diagnosis. Uh, there's a very high rate, up to 30% of false negatives with liquid biopsy technologies right now. And the cell-free uh, DNA testing technology, well, anything floating around in the blood 
can uh, potentially show up on these assays. So you actually get alterations that are unrelated to the uh, cancer you may be trying to treat or diagnose. And one particular example of that is a phenomenon called uh, clonal hematopoiesis of indeterminate potential, where the bone marrow cells are actually producing mutations and shedding those into the uh, circulating uh, blood as well. So that's something to keep in mind. So what is the usefulness of um, uh, liquid biopsy in non-small cell lung cancers right now? Well, the patient is medically unfit to undergo an invasive tissue sampling technique. Uh, liquid biopsy may be appropriate. And if you actually run out of uh, tissue, uh, say a small uh, core biopsy that has no, no more DNA in it or is no, not fit for testing, uh, uh, you can use a liquid biopsy according to the NCCN. Uh, so uh, there are some joint publications put out by um, the Association of uh, American Society of Clinical Oncology as well as the uh, College of American Pathologists. They said that uh, basically uh, very few assays have clinical validity or utility right now. Uh, there is some evidence uh, uh, that shows a discordance between uh, the circulating DNA in the blood and what we see in the tumor. Um, so it really supports, if you're going to use a liquid biopsy um, and it doesn't have anything of interest or no mutations in it, you may want to test the tissue as well. Uh, um, and so right now they said there's no evidence of any clinical utility uh, with regard to diagnosing early stage cancers, treatment monitoring, uh, such as uh, minimal residual disease testing, or in cancer screening. Uh, there, this is a rapidly developing area, and it's going to be very exciting uh, to watch this as it moves forward and uh, actually gain some clinical utility and the necessary studies that are going to go forward with this is going to be very, very exciting. So uh, we're very much anticipating some developments in that area. So a little bit of a summary here. Uh, Pathologist-initiated uh, testing uh, has numerous benefits in this area of complex genomics. Um, pathological screening of endometrial and colon cancers for Lynch syndrome is now standard of care. And uh, you can basically use any specimen types, including our routine um, formal and fixed paraffin embedded tissues. Um, and uh, keep in mind that NGS is now sort of replacing some of those old conventional models of molecular diagnostics. So, thank you. Questions? Questions? So um, the next speaker is uh, Dr. Sarat Darabi, uh, and uh, she joined us here as part of the Precision Medicine Program from AMBRI, uh, which is a genetics testing firm, in June um, of last summer, and um, she's already made great contributions. And we uh, work to review all the samples from Keras and then do consults and available if um, a physician has a you know a genetics re or a genomics report from another vendor uh, to review. She's uh, earned her bachelor's and master's degree in biology with a focus in molecular biology and microbiology. She did her PhD in healthcare genetics at Clemson, and as I said, she used to work at Ambry and previously at other academic and research medical centers. So she's here to talk to us about how we analyze variants that are identified and then interpret them. Well, thank you so much for the introduction, Dr. Demore, and hello again to everyone. Um, this is um, the area that I am always excited about, and I can talk about variant um, assessment for hours, but I just have 15 minutes. I have to fit in the basics now, and hopefully in future seminars, if, if you're interested, we can cover more. Um, just if you're wondering uh, what I do, this is, this is where I'm sitting uh, in my office. The picture is courtesy of Astrid, and this is when I'm actually posing for a picture. And this is what my office looks like otherwise. So it's, it's very busy. Um, I usually use computer more, so it's more like in computer, um, um, two monitors busy, but this is what it's looked like. Um, just a recap from part A, um, Dr. Dumour talked about protein synthesis. I'm just going to go over it quickly. Um, we have our DNA, we have um, coding exons and then intervening um, introns um, uh, through transcription and um, 
um, RNA mature is um, intranasal spliced out, so the splicing is important when we do variant assessment because where the splicing happens and if there's a mutation in that area can change the protein um, and also the uh, translator to uh, protein. Um, a, a little um, um, recap on the human genetic variations that the mutations are changed in the DNA sequence. We covered that last time. Any change in the DNA sequence that can be from a single nucleotide to the entire chromosome. So there are different classification of mutations, but I like this one that is a, either a structural variance that can be from the adding or deleting of the entire chromosome, or um, smaller deletion, insertion, copy number variants, or we have single nucleotide variants. Different terminology we use, and we tend to be confusing. We call them SNVs, we call them a SNP, we call them point mutations, and um, these are uh, different term terminology that we use. Um, single base mutation, this is just a simplified sample. When um, the, um, the single mutation happens, if it changed the code that um, changed the amino acid that coded, then that is called missense. If it doesn't change the amino acid, it changes it to a stop codon, that it stops the translation, that it makes the protein shorter than it's supposed to be, that is called nonsense mutation. Or it might, um, the, the change might turn into same amino acid, uh, which we call it silent mutation, which they're not always uh, benign. Uh, there are some cases that the silent mutation that they can cause um, changes in the protein. Friendship mutations, on the other hand, are any addition or insertion or deletion of the nucleotide that changed the three codon sequence, and that would call frame shift. Um, Jeannie talked about direct to consumer. We talked about technology, how, um, how many people, how many scientists are involved in from uh, seeing the patient as genetic counseling till the interpretation of the data, and then you can see um, that is not possible for direct to consumer genetic testing to do all this uh, with the $100 kit that they uh, provide. So, uh, what I will cover is just a little bit of um, classification as, uh, of variants, and then I use uh, the available guidelines. Um, I just want to clarify something here that um, we use in a laboratory. There are two different kind of classifications. We have gene classification, which is a gene disease relationship. This is where the beginning of we decide if this gene associated with this disease. So that is used for any panel design or exome sequencing. Different laboratories have different ways. They're, they're, they didn't have um, till like um, 2017, 2018 any uh, quantitative studies and measurements to um, assign gene to disease, but um, there are some publications that shows the, the evidence that they use for gene disease relationship. Whereas now in the gene focus, it's a variant classification that is specific gene. That gene already is associated with the disease, and we just want to know if that specific variant caused the disease. So that could be germline um, or somatic, and different laboratories, they have their own um, classification. Um, I have a couple of papers here that shows gene disease relationship criteria, the evidence that we use. So this paper published um, in 2017 when I was at Ambry. So we, we tested out different ways, a different line of evidence, and this is semi-quantitative. So we give points for, for example, for patients and functional studies, sev several lines of evidence we use. We add them up together to come up with the idea of if this gene is associated with the disease. So that could be from no evidence till definitive. For example, a definitive gene disease relationship would be BRCA1 to breast cancer. That's the definitive gene disease relationship, whereas if you say, is BRCA1 definitive for cardiomyopathy? No, that could be no evidence or limited evidence if somebody actually sat down and um, analyzed that. Uh, ClinGen is another one that published um, another a gene disease relationship clinical validity uh, at the same year, uh, the ClinGen criteria is more in, uh, stringent, um, whereas the one that Ambry published is um, more feasible for clinical laboratories to use. So now, if, if, for example, if your clinician, you call the laboratory and said, I want this gene to be added to this panel because I've, I read a paper for it. 
they're not going to add it to the panel. They have to do this gene disease relationship scoring to see if it's worth adding. Because if, if you're adding a gene um, that is not associated with the disease to a panel, you get a lot of variance of uncertain significance, and you don't know what to do with it. OK, now with the variant classification and interpretation. So um, when you get a variant, um, the first thing you need to do is just scratch your head and say, what am I going to do with this? There are several different steps that you need to take to be able to analyze, uh, classify, and interpret a variant. Um, I will have a couple examples today, but it's not full. It's just a basic classification. So in 2015, um, ACMG and AMP, American College of Medical Gene uh, Genetics and Genomics, uh, they're the group of people, group of experts. They did several survey, and they come up with this. Um, suggestion recommendation for variant classification for all the uh, laboratories to use or um, for their variant classification. So the, the term variant that we're trying to use a lot instead of mutational alteration that comes from the ACMG guidelines, they recommend that with the following modifiers. Um, so um, you see the arrow goes to the right is likely pathogenic and pathogenic. These are the ones that we know, we know what to do with them. Or to the far left, they're either benign or likely benign. And then we have variant of uncertain or unknown significant in the middle. This is the one um, that um, is, is very confusing and time-consuming for clinician, for people at the laboratory to see how they want to deal with this. And it's very hard because we don't know what to do with them. There are several reasons. The variant of a VUS can be because there's not enough evidence, or it could be because there are conflicting evidence, or because there's no evidence at all. So because of those reasons, we don't know what to do with them. So what we do, we watch it um, every six months to a year. The regional laboratories can reevaluate their VUSs to see if there's a new paper or any, any other additional evidence can be added to either go higher or go lower. This is the table that we go by when we want to analyze a variant. Is the ACMG guidelines provided is 28 criteria each one of them have a code. So when we have any of this criteria uh, for our variant, we use the code, and then we use this rule, and then we combine those codes and come up with, the, with, with our classification. I will have a couple examples for that. But going back to this, when you go to the left, is again going toward the benign, um, strong and supporting evidence for the benign variants, whereas when you go to the right, is a supporting moderate and a strong and very strong um, for uh, pathogenicity. Lines of evidence that's used, this is just two examples. Clinical data is a very important part of variant classification and interpretation is clinical data. We do a lot of other things, but clinical data has more weight to the classification. Type of variant is important. We need to know um, what is a variant, and uh, we go by, like, there if it's a missense, nonsense, or silence, frame shift, indel, CNVs, big deletion, big insertions. Um, literature, we, of course, review literature, we go to um, different sources we have, PubMed, uh, Google Scholar, or any, any available uh, tools that we have to look at the primary literature. We also look at functional data. Functional data also very important when we want to classify variant. We might just, um, based on the evidence, we can say, oh, this variant could be pathogenic, but functional data is the one that actually shows it affects protein. So if we don't have any functional data, we cannot for sure say if this, this variant is pathogenic. Segregation data, this is important too. This goes back to clinical data again. If the disease in the family doesn't go from generation to generation, so we need to think twice about that, that variant. If it doesn't cause disease in all people, it doesn't segregate the, uh, with, the, with the family, then we should uh, consider that. Um, we talked about the splicing. Canonical site is the, the site that um, um, splicing happen. If that changes, then that could affect uh, the protein.
population data. There are some databases that they have healthy population information and data available to us to use. So if we're assessing a variant and we think, okay, this variant could be pathogenic, and we look at the population database and we see, oh, there is a lot of them seen in a healthy population. So that, that will be another line of evidence saying, so this probably not causing a disease if we see it a lot in a healthy population. There are also some computeral, computational models that is used that are algorithms. They call them in silico models. Um, they don't have that much weight in um, classification, but we, we consider that like conservations, the splicing um, tools, and different other tools that I will have examples for. There are different available pop, um, databases. We have like population databases, disease databases that they are specific to the disease, also specialties, like we have cancer-specific variant databases. Um, there are also like Insight, which is a GI database. So there are different databases that we use um, to classify variants for that specific uh, disease. Sequence databases, we have the uh, like RevSeq is a um, sequence that is available for us. We can compare our patient with the available uh, sequence in silico models we talked about. Example number one, I emphasize to the basic here because this is basic. This is not a full variant classification. Sometimes full variant classification might take five to seven hours. So this is just a few slides showing basic variant classification and interpretation. So for both examples, I use BRCA1 gene. So I have an example of BRCA1 gene. The one on the top is, is BRCA mutation in somatic. So I took that from CBIO portal. Um, database that shows somatic mutations reported in BRCA1. The one on the bottom is from NOMAD, but shows the ClinVar pathogenic and likely pathogenic only um, uh, variants in BRCA1. The first example is a BRCA1 um, uh, variant that um, I search ClinVar, and a term is BRCA1 with a cDNA or a protein. We'll put it in the um, database, and it gives us the reported um, variants in this database. So this is specific variant reported by several laboratories. So most of the laboratories, they share their data. They deposit their um, variants into ClinVar. This is very important, sharing data, because this would help also with the classification. Unfortunately, some of other laboratories that they have um, the most data, uh, they don't share. So for this specific variant, all the major laboratories, they classify this as benign. Human Gene Mutation Database, or we call it HGMD all the time. This is the database that uh, is curated and all the variants that are associated with human disease are deposited into this database, including their, um, the literature, primary literature, additional functional studies, anything that you can think of that uh, is related to that specific variant. So this um, database called this um, not pathogenic. And these are the literature that is cited for that specific, specific variant, HGMD. This is just a screenshot of it, so it could be more than that that is there. So we normally look at every single paper to make sure that they all agree, because if, if functional data or anything, they don't agree, they don't fall into benign, then we have to go to the VUS if they're conflicting evidence. So this is a very time-consuming, labor-intensive um, classification. Polythen is an in silico computer model that I was talking about um, that for this specific variant I had to keep um, screenshot the, the sequence and put it in the polythene and the polythene predicted this variant is benign. The other one is NOMAD. NOMAD is that population database that I was talking about that is available um, freely to everyone that you can just put your variant in, and if it's identified in, uh, in that healthy population, they have the information. So as you can see, this variant was uh, seen in healthy population in 5% allele frequency. We're going back to our ACMG guideline, and we go over to the left. This is where the standalone benign um, evidence 
So they call it a lead frequency is about 5% in, um, in exact database. So Nomad database is the newer version of exact database. Exact it only covers Exxon database, but Nomad also covers um, genomic database also. So this is five more than 5%. Going back to our rules, this is classified as benign. The next variant is again is in BRCA1. Um, this, this was reported again uh, in ClinVar in several laboratory um, and they all classify this as pathogenic. HGMD has 50 articles reported for this specific variant, so it didn't fit in here, so I didn't have it. Also, they classify it as pathogenic. This specific variant um, is recurrent in uh, Polish, German, uh, German, Czech Republic, and Austrian uh, population when it was reported for one paper. MCAP. MCAP is another in silico model that I use. So I took a sequence again and put it in MCAP, and they predicted that this would be possibly damaging. NOMAD database for this specific variant, as you can see on the bottom, is about 0.003% allele frequency. So this is rare. What we expect is that if, if the variant is rare in healthy population, means that could cause a disease. So this will be supporting. The most important part also other than the clinical information is the functional study that I, I, we were mentioning. Um, this, um, this is just two specific papers I picked. There are several functional data on a specific, this variant. One of them says this drops the function of the BRCA protein. The other one reports that it was seen in tumors with the loss of heterozygosity. So this plus um, several other functional papers shows and supports pathogenicity. Going back to our table, you see um, all this um, orange boxes here are the lines of evidence we use with their codes. Then we go back to our rules. Um, we have two strong evidence, um, lines of evidence, um, PS3 and PS4 based on a table. This is enough to make this pathogenic. However, we have two other supporting evidence, and we classify this as pathogenic. So these are just the two examples that I had for variant classification. The guidelines are not perfect. So always professional judgment is required when you analyze the variant. Sometimes it requires a lot of people sit together in meetings to discuss that because one person might not be satisfied with the lines of evidence that's available or the, the functional data that is not sat satisfactory. So that's why the people sit together in meetings and decide if they want to classify it as pathogenic or not. Um, ACMG guidelines are not perfect, and they're, they're, their working group are trying to work together to come up with better ideas. One of the, the most um, um, important part of the ACMG guidelines that um, has um, a lot of um, complications is the, this code called PVS1, which is a standalone calling a variant pathogenic. So this is very important, a null variant, which is a nonsense frame shift that actually expected to affect protein, will be by itself um, classifying a variant pathogenic as a standalone if the loss of function is a mechanism of the disease. However, it requires a lot more details and a specification. So a few months ago, this group of people that some of them are part of the ACMG guideline originally, they came up with the recommendation of revisions of that specific line of evidence. So now, if you want to use the PVS1 or the one for the null variance for loss of function, you need to go to that paper and see if you still meet that um, guidelines. This paper published on Monday, um, and I thought it was interesting uh, because there was a survey on different laboratories in the U.S. and also international to see how many of them actually use ACMG guidelines or how they use ACMG guidelines because we have a lot of discrepancies in variant classification and interpretation and they want to know why. 95% use the five-tier classification. Remember that figure I had with dots? 
that's the one that 95% use the same terminology, the same classification, five tier. 36% use the same criteria as is defined with no modifications, so use the same. 44% have their similar, and then 17% have more advanced. So personally, I know in details what embryogenetics classification is and also in vitae. So uh, different laboratories have their own. Um, most of them share what they have, but we don't know some of them how they do classify their variants, unfortunately. So Embry provides this online. This is what I know. Instead of PVS1 or PVS2, they have A, B, C. So there's just like a little different terminology, but is um, more stringent, like more um, conservative when compared to ACM gene guideline. Also, in Vitae, Sherlock, the same. Um, GeneDx has its own, LabCorp, Council, or many more laboratories. They provide those online for everyone to view. Um, the, last, the last one I want to talk about is somatic variant classification. So most of the laboratories that we work with for analyzing the variant, they use ACMG guidelines or their modified version of ACMG guideline. However, this paper by Lee et al. Um, published in 2017 with recommendation of clinical impact of the given variant when, when we analyze in the somatic mutations or variants. So they are tier-based. is not like ACMG guidelines with the codes. They are tiers, and the, the tier base is based on um, the therapy, if, if there is an FDA approved for that specific tumor, or if there is a, a FDA approved therapy for another tumor with the same um, variant, or if there's um, enough uh, preclinical trials or well-powered studies. So they have different type of classification. However, most of the laboratories still use ACMG guidelines and some with in combination with the somatic. There are a lot of challenges in variant classification and interpretation because we, we use a lot of next generation sequencing and then we have more challenges because we identify more. As we mentioned, the guidelines are not perfect and being not applicable to all scenarios. We cannot, it doesn't fit for all. Also, obtaining clinical information is very important, and I cannot emphasize that more, from genetic counselor, from the clinician. So when the laboratories are actually analyzing the data, they really rely on what is provided to them. So this is important. If, if you're sending a patient or a sample to a laboratory for analyzing, provide as much as clinical information as you can with a family history or personal history that would help them with analyzing and interpreting the data. Challenges of VUSs. Again, and I cannot emphasize more, VUSs are a big challenge. We cannot um, act on them. We don't know what to do with them till we actually know if they're going up, be pathogenic or likely pathogenic, or they be benign or likely benign. So we need to keep looking. We need to keep following. Usually the laboratories, they send out um, reclassification um, notice to the clinician so they know if, if the classification has changed. Discrepancies between different laboratories, and then um, the next one is actually can be um, part of this one, lack of data sharing. If all the laboratories share their data together, they can combine clinical information and they can come up with the more um, advanced and um, more un united way of classifying. Um, ClinVar, um, recently with ClinGen, they um, they did a research study, they collected certain labs, and they put um, some of the variants, and then they asked different labs to analyze them. And then they come up with different classifications, and then they asked them to go in the groups and resolve that. And they did, and they came out with that. So what they're doing now, they're asking um, in batches, they send it to clinical laboratories with the ones that they are described and resolved, and they ask them to work together and resolve that. So that would help patients. Highly manual process, um, as I said, it takes hours, and this is where the variant is actually identified. This doesn't include all the laboratory work, bioinformatics work. This is where actually a variant analysis, get the variant to the analyst. And also, what are we going to do with it? Medical management decisions are um, also one of the um, challenges with variant classifications. Any questions? <laughs>
Yes. Well, the last statement, uh, kind of all. <laughs> so what you're saying is if we have a very unknown significance, we call you an aggregate and tell us what to do with it. Uh, so if we get one, because sometimes we get one, and we breathe a sigh of relief, oh yeah, this is great, we have very unknown significance. So clearly it's not significant. The pronouns that they give us, if you can tell us the relative percent probability of this being seen in a normal population, right? So that should give us some relief if we see it greater than 5%. Yeah, well, so, no, if it's greater than 5%, then that's benign. Yeah. Yeah. So if we see that, that's the golden rule. Yeah, but then they, they would not classify it as a VUS. But VUS, when they say, um, um, there, are, there are three scenarios. If there's no evidence, right. there's um, not enough evidence, or they conflicting evidence. Right. And the worst part is the conflicting evidence. Because if you, there's no evidence, there might be in a year or two, you might have some, some more evidence. Right. Or if it's um, not enough evidence, then, then you can wait. But when is uh, conflicting evidence, that's where it is, is very complicated. And it requires a lot of people. And that's where clinical data comes handy and helpful when you can combine those. So when we get the reading, The interpretation that we get, do they give us a relative indication of how worried we should be about this variant, even though it's not significant? Because as far as I'm concerned, it might as well be positive. I'm just going to put it on a really stringent kind of a monitor schedule short of suggested surgery. Would that be an appropriate approach for this? No, for variant of unknown significant. No management, nothing in guidelines, no action required till the actual. You can follow up with the patient right. with different measures, but for that specific variant of unknown significant, nothing should be done till actually we know if this reclassified. I think if you, um, excuse me, Francis, if there was a, uh, we had a lecture here from Dr. Merchant, yeah. talked about genetic malpractice, and there was a case in one of his writings about a lawsuit where somebody had. Uh, prophylactic mastectomy for BUS in BRCA. So certainly you don't want to do that. <laughs> most BUSs, if you look statistically, right. most of them eventually get classified benign. Right. I mean statistically, but some do then become classified as pathogenic. Is there Friends, I'm, sorry. They, I'm sorry, well, is Go there ahead. an interval where they reevaluate that unknown significance? Like, is it just random and they'll give you data on that? So it depends on the laboratory. Some laboratories have this this process that they check them every six months. But as they go, if they have evidence and they see evidence, or the other laboratory, they call them and say, you call this VUS, we just found this patient, would you reclassify this? That's another story. They have to, but they have to send out the report. It's based on the laboratory. Francis had a comment about your government. So, so do you know how when you show that um, the population there, for example, you can tell the discrepancy So yeah, you're right. The, the more tests we do, the more VUS we detect. The more we genes on a panel, the more VUS we get. So 
Um, yeah, this is an is ongoing process between the laboratories to come up, and one VUS might be seen in one, you know, in one patient, and nobody can see it in five years. So it's very hard to reclassify those, whereas some um, families. And also, I didn't mention that some of these lines of evidence, we want to make sure we don't double dip. Because one clinical data from one laboratory might be a sister for the other one from the other laboratory. We need to make sure that we don't use two, you know, as a two evidence when there's just one. Yeah, question. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so I'm going to finish up with briefly with uh, just a review of what's out there on the market right now. Um, so obviously there's a, no pun intended, myriad of tests available. And that's one of the companies that test, but there's quite a few available. And, and so really when we look at them, you have to look at various aspects. Uh, there are technical aspects, uh, number of genes, how well they annotate in terms of making association with drugs, the coverage, whether they do hotspots or cover the entire coding sequence of a gene, for example. Um, the depth of sequences was how many times they actually sample. It may be very adequate in whole, whole genome when you're doing germline from pure you know, white blood cell DNA to have sequencing depths of 30x. But in tumors, you're looking for 500x because you want to pick up and increase the sensitivity of detection of uh, rare mutations. Turnaround time, obviously, if it takes three months to get a result on somebody with cancer, that's not going to be satisfactory. And Dr. Braxton talked about very nicely how, you know, two weeks is sort of the standard now, and we're doing better than that for results, at least of tumor testing. Uh, the labs, the analytical and clinical validity and clinical utility are things that CLIA looks at in terms of that and, and insurers look at in terms of um, uh, deciding to pay. But this is, if a mutation is present, is it really there, you know, and, and, that, and then how useful is it in terms of if that variant is actually associated with the disease or that doctors use it to make decisions and taking care of patients. And this is maybe where the direct, uh, the consumer uh, things fall apart in terms of analytical validity and clinical validity. So the, the, the major quality control agencies are CLIA and CAP, and ideally you want uh, your testing vendor to be certified by both entities. Insurance paying for it and getting reimbursement and the reimbursement policy, some, will, some labs will uh, limit the financial burden on patient to a certain amount based on you know, uh, either hardship or just as a general matter of policy. Um, and then uh, really important, and you saw that Sequencing is somewhat becoming a commodity and that the price is coming down, but the time and effort and the amount of people to make the annotations to either is a variant uh, have clinical significance or matching it to drugs that might then help you take care of a patient, that process is still very labor intensive. It's not well automated at all, so it takes a lot of time and there's expense associated with that. So again, the next generation sequencing panels, as we talked about, you can have targeted panels looking at relatively small number of genes or, or larger panels looking at uh, more genes. Uh, and, and again, that'll affect cost to some extent and turnaround time. The smaller panels do have a shorter turnaround time in general. Exome, again, is looking at all the coding sequences. Uh, and again, for a tumor, you need a higher sequencing depth of coverage, if you will, or sequence the same gene more times. And then the whole gene se sequence that we already talked about a little bit is typically not used for tumors, but used more for uh, looking at uh, whole blood and, and germline testing. The other big difference between a lot of tests is whether they look at tumor only or, or whether they do a subtraction analysis where you subtract the genomic variant. So tumors and tumor cells also have normal background DNA. Um, and some of those are not, I'll say, clinically significant. And so you can have what we essentially look at as false positive mutations. So the labs that uh, subtract out the background germline variants 
um, and then just report on only tumor-specific variants or mutations are, are available. Um, and there's some debate about that. Some One of the labs has published a paper uh, touting that you can bioinformatically sort out which ones are uh, only tumor uh, or tumor specific and you don't actually have to sequence the uh, blood DNA. I tell you, most people don't really buy into that. Uh, judging by the fact that paper took several years to get published and was published in a pretty minor journal. So I, I think most people didn't really take that seriously as far as a bioinformatic approach. But in this way, you don't want to necessarily treat somebody based on a germline, on a germline variant that pre uh, present in their tumor. So again, looking at the panels, and this is building on what Surratt told you, is you can have tumors that are very well associated with disease, as in BRCA1, and uh, there's a lot of clinical evidence behind it. It's uh, highly penetrant, perhaps like even RET um, in uh, thyroid cancer. You have close to 100% penetrance in uh, medullary thyroid cancer. Uh, so you have these, and they're actionable because either we have, they affect clinical decisions or we have drugs that you can use that, uh, for that, and therefore reimbursement is very likely because of the high clinical utility. Then you have sort of the, the larger sort of basket, if you will, and these genes may have a moderate association with disease or moderate penetrance. In other words, you can, you know, the, the predictability of actually having cancer with that gene may not be quite as strong, but there's some evidence, and uh, again, reimbursement then becomes a little less likely. And then there's this larger basket of cancer-associated genes, and this is how you get some of these very large panels with uh, five, 600 genes. You know, they, they may not all be actionable, but actually the, the incremental cost of adding you know, another 100 genes when you're already doing 500 is relatively low in terms of the cost of sequencing and things like that. So they include these, and some of these genes become more relevant as new drugs are developed and things like that, or new clinical evidence comes about. So the information that's found in a typical report is, you know, the reported, the reported uh, aberrations that you see, or the variants in the tumor. They'll annotate it toward drugs that are FDA approved for that particular cancer. For argument's sake, if you have an elk rearrangement, a lung cancer, they'll annotate it to the class of drugs called elk inhibitors like crizotinib or seritinib. And, uh, and there's you know, level one evidence that suggests that that's you know, uh, efficacious treatment for that patient's tumor. On the other hand, you may get an FDA approved uh, tumor for another cancer. There may be a rare cancer that has an elk fusion that you detect, it's not a lung cancer, but you may want that be that drug may help that patient. So you would use an FDA approved drug, but for an off label indication. So they may give you uh, that uh, annotation as well. Um, they'll usually report out variants of unknown uh, or uncertain significance that uh, Surat talked about. And then some of them will have ex access to uh, expert support, um, or you have Suratin our team here to help you with that as well, uh, to review things. But, and, and these are the type of services that the labs uh, provide. Uh, these are some of the major vendors and ones that we, we are, when David was talking about reflex testing, most of the reflex testing done here is done through Keras Labs. <clears throat> and there are tests called uh, molecular intelligence. It's a panel of 592 genes. They do tumor only. They don't do normal subtraction. They give you, as David said, markers of uh, tumor mutational burden, uh, which might inform um, the efficacy of, uh, of using the immune checkpoint inhibitors. They don't look at TERP uh, promoter methylation, which may be important in certain tumors like thyroid cancer, and uh, recently approved were NTREC uh, uh, drugs that 1% or roughly of some different cancers have uh, fusions or gene rearrangements in NTREC uh, 1, 2, or 3 genes. And uh, the new drug is very efficacious uh, in a variety of tumors, so they do report on all those. Foundation One is another very common vendor. Are very, they probably have the largest market share overall. Has a panel, again, 300 plus genes, tumor only. Um, same kind of thing reporting out on uh, mutational burden. But, and don't look at NTREC 1 and 2, but don't have 3 on their panel. Tempest is a relatively new uh, testing company, same uh, guy that had uh, started Groupon, uh, the internet company, that uh, started Tempest. Uh, I think is at least the story that I've heard is his wife had breast cancer and 
and so that uh, he got into the uh, testing business as, as all that. And uh, they do do tumor normal uh, subtraction and um, have a very robust panel. Um, Providence St. Joe's, who we, we are now also working with, uh, has their own in-house panel of 170 genes, and they plan to expand that. They don't do tumor normal um, and all that, and they don't cover all the fusions, but they say they're online. Um, Perhaps one of the other very well-knowns is Memorial Sloan Kettering's in-house uh, impact panel, 468 genes with tumor normal subtraction. The power that they have is actually that they uh, have all the clinical data as well from Memorial Sloan Kettering and treatment outcome. So they have a very robust uh, database that I think um, will be able to mine for uh, not only great publications, but uh, you know we can learn from. So. In conclusion, uh, sequencing technology has and continues to drive uh, advances um, in cancer care and care in other fields, as Dr. DeLilly showed, transcends into other fields. Cancer may be leading the way, but it really, all the other fields, it is impacting everything in every field of medicine. And largely that's because the costs are coming down. We do have analytic challenges that have been detailed. But we have a wide variety of testing, uh, panel testing, and then as cost continues to come down, whole exome and whole genome. We will eventually bring online RNA and proteomics as the technology advances. Uh, we're starting to, you can do RNA now to, to pick up gene rearrangements. That's pretty much standard, and you get that out of paraffin for levels of, relative levels of gene expression. That's, I don't know if anybody is doing that in a CLIA certified way yet. Proteomics is still very, very complex from a, you know, any kind of um, clinical testing for cancer or other uh, routine use yet. Um, I think we're going to also see more serial somatic testing, as David talked about last uh, time. Tumors evolve over time, or you get you may effectively treat one clone and have emergence of resistance. So you'll see sequential testing to uh, tailor treatment as well. We'll have also improved informatics. Right now, the the um, annotation to drugs is very linear. You have a BRAF mutation, you get a BRAF inhibitor. But combination of drugs, sequencing of drugs, is um, in that level of annotation still pretty much in its infancy. And um, no, none of the commercial labs are annotating the combination of drugs yet that, uh, for the most part. Um, but we'll see an increasing role in clinical care. So we'll take questions from myself or anybody else on the, on the panel. And I um, appreciate your attendance. But. Well, so the labs have an option, for example, like Tempest, where you can check a box and you can get a germline report. So, but that requires consent from the patient, um, and like the genetic counselors do, and an informed consent. You don't need that informed consent for the tumor testing. So most of the tumor normal subtraction labs won't report out the germline. They'll use it to filter out the germline reports and not give you the quote unquote false positive. But if you, uh, the labs will, for the most part, provide you a germline report if the patient is consented and requests that. So, but if you were looking for BR, BRCA1, for instance, and you, you didn't do the specific test, you would miss that actually on a subtraction. Well, yeah, so I, I think I, maybe I oversimplified it. I know when I worked at Ashaya, we, we exactly turned off the filter for BRCA because we did not want to filter that out. So I think it's a more informed tumor normal subtraction. The same thing maybe for RET or something, but for BRCA we, we did not subtract because, and again, as uh, we talked about last time, that um, we have a protocol in place for if we identify BRCA mutation in a tumor on a Keras report, we'll contact the primary care uh, or, or the oncologist will contact the patient's physician and say, consider referral to a genetic counselor if the patient's not already been tested. And we have a list of genes that we do that for. The, um, back to the so I'm presuming that once you test the data, oh, there's going to change the status of the gene now to the more In a perfect world, and the labs have different testing policies, and maybe for a certain period of time or whatever, and, so, and the labs vary a little bit. 
but yeah, and ethically, and they should have at least a policy for informing people about a change in classification. So you recommend that as a doc, you get some of these to go online every six months, and one of these team profiles themselves to make sure it's still unsignificant? Uh, or you can send it to me. Well, but that's, that's a, I mean, but... That's quite a burden. I mean, that's quite a burden on uh, yeah, on physicians. So again, that's where this liability for these things is still an evolving field. All right. No more questions. Thank you very much for attending. All of you. Appreciate it.